Hello, my name is John Harding. I farm with my wife Sally and my oldest son Wes and his wife Tina and my youngest son Lewis. We farm 6,650 hectares, which is 10 k's east of Ongrup in a rainfall of about 375 to 400 mils. We um, are total croppers and we run control traffic in our systems. So Sally and I come out here in 1995 from Boy Brook and we noticed there was tall wheatgrass growing in some salty areas on the road and we, we harvested some of that and started to move it around to improve our salt country. After discovering the wheatgrass, we've been able to fit it in our program as in, in the middle of paddocks, if there's a, a salt scold, we don't actually have to fence it off anymore because we're not utilising it for livestock. So with no sheep involved, we've, we've able to plant in our saline areas and if it's a, a pocket in the middle of a paddock, we can just continue over the top of it without seeding into it to work with our controlled traffic lines. And for us, it remains a permanent feature in our landscape, which has worked well in our system to utilise the excess groundwater using an annual rainfall for a hay production and then a possible seed production if we got some summer rain. So in the early years in Ongarup, we joined uh, the Mills Lake group and we were putting pisometers down to get a reading on the groundwater. And, and in the beginning, it was sort of only a metre, metre and a half down. Now today, we just re-dipped them at two metres. Whether it is the dry years that are making a difference or the perennials, I don't know, but it's a positive anyway. So at the beginning of cropping in any year, I will get the seed of hopefully before the boys start seeding and, and patch out the tall wheatgrass areas that I want. And we'll sometimes go back and reseed areas because we have our own seed to um, top up the areas that haven't taken that well. So that ensures that we've got a really good density of tall wheatgrass, which covers bare ground, which we don't have any issues with blowing in our systems now. So in the beginning, we were utilising it for the saline areas, but we've got an excess amount of crab oil country on the land that we've bought east of Ongarup. So we were seeding all that country down to wheatgrass. Now we've come to a situation now where we feel like we should try and level the land and so we've employed scrapers to level the country and go back cropping it and if it doesn't work because of the salinity in the soil we will we'll just revert back to wheatgrass but at least it will be level and we'll be able to cut it for hay and then be able to harvest the seed of it. Jeremy Lemon from the Ag Department is doing some trials on the Karakarup Road on our property with heavy grey malt clay. He will give you a description of what a crab oil actually is. The soils of the south coast are characterised by quite high clay contents, either as shallow duplex soils or by soils that are clay right to the surface. These soils extend right across the south coast from around about Mindarabin right through to north of Condinga. Most of the clays on the south coast are kaolinite, which doesn't have much shrink swell, but there are patches of a different types of clays that have got a lot more shrink swell in them, and they can lead to the formation of Gilgai landscapes. John Harding's place is interesting because he's got a high proportion of shrink swell clays uh, in the, the crab hole country, or the Gilgai country that's on his property. And Gilgai's are formed by clays that have got a high shrink swell as they wet and dry. When they're dry, material falls down the cracks and when they get wet again, the cracks close up as the clays expand. And it's a bit like an expansion joint in concrete, uh, although that's driven by heat rather than water content. And when the, the clay gets wet and the cracks close up, then the whole soil surface heaves, uh, forming the mounds and depressions 
Uh, they quite often fill up with water and hence the common name of crab holes. Crab holes vary in size and shape, uh, but the scale of them is usually around the 10 to 15 metre type size, uh, depending on the amount uh, and type of clay and how much swelling you get in that clay. So with the tall wheatgrass, we can utilise it in hay production in September, which promotes it to grow more. And then if we get summer rains, we tend to get a good seed production and we can harvest it at sort of end of April into May, we will go and harvest it. In the harvest process, we used to use one of our standard harvesters. There's no anything flash about that. And we, we tend to get a fair bit, but it's got a lot of short straws in it. So we have to use a grading process we've done ourselves to, to eliminate them. Now that, that takes about five times through the system to make it work. But at the end of the day, you've got a good product you can actually put through an air seeder without blockages. With the hay production, it's actually been working very well because we cut a lot of the ryegrass seed out of our areas of tall wheatgrass. Because being a perennial grass, it grows all year round and utilises all the water and potentially doesn't give the ryegrass anything to grow off at the beginning of the season. So just in recent times we've purchased a slasher to slash all of our wheatgrass at this time of the year down so we can make it actively grow before we cut it for hay. So with the EM machine that we've been using with the Ag Department, there seems to be a very positive result with um, freshly grown tall wheatgrass, seems to be reducing the levels of salt below the root zones. So the economical benefits we've found from tall wheatgrass is fairly obvious. We're actually utilising land that was at going saline. So the hay production has worked for us and then mostly the seed production is probably the more positive out of it. Some of our work in the earlier years was done under planting of trees. So we'd seed the wheatgrass first and then plant trees onto it. And that we have astounding results where if the trees don't take, at least you've got wheatgrass utilising the groundwater. We've done a lot of tree planting over the years and that has worked for us, but now we're seeing more of an economical benefit with wheatgrass, but it's probably not all about profitability, it's probably more about the aesthetically pleasing look of the farm when you drive around it. So our farming systems has changed since we came in the early days to try and improve it and make it sustainable for future generations and we hope that they can continue on the work that we've tried to set up and keep pushing forward to improve more. <laughs>